So we've just arrived at the site of San Lorenzo. It's 26 kilometers down, a kind of almost mostly dirt track from the main highway near Akiyukan. But last time I was here was 2009, but it looks like uh, it's open. So we're gonna go and check out the one Olmec head they have here and some of the other amazing stone pieces and see if we can actually go and find uh, the actual mound site as well. Uh, we're gonna ask, see if we can see some of the actual location of the site. So we have two kind of bulbous type heads here. Not sure if these were actually small Olmec heads, whether they were just something else. Again, we're gonna see a lot of worn, very worn, weathered pieces here. But still, these, are, these look like they're actually part. These are like they're part of the uh, water system they had. And it, you know, they had like channels going for, often for miles, you know, going all the way through the whole area. And this is like, this looks like part of that. And you can see it's got a lot, a lot of erosion on it, where the water's been. Whereas this piece here is quite remarkable. This is what, 12, 14 feet long. huge megalithic block it must be like 10 foot by five feet something like that and you can see these little enclaves it's like they've been scooped out these literally these are like cup marks but they've been scooped out much like we find we see actually examples of this the scooping at Machu Picchu and at Aswan quarry in Egypt it looks like it's the same kind of technique this is one mighty piece of basalt rock. You can see the size of it just from the car next to it. Very large, what, like five feet wide, circular disc. It looks like it's got glyphs all around the edge here. This is very interesting. Look, you can see some of the shapes here. Carved onto it, it's very badly weathered. This could be a representation. It could be a calendar stone. This is the earliest known Olmec site. It's potentially the Olmec capital. It used to be between two tributaries of the coastal Cocos River, almost like on an island, on a raised area. And it's known that they bought stone from the Tuxla Mountains and that throughout the site, even the main pyramid um, mound up on the site, there was, had these sluice gates, it had these stone basalt, water channels throughout the site, which not only irrigated the site, but created electric charge. Also at San Lorenzo, they found what could be the oldest known compass in the world, this small piece of magnetite, where it's only a few inches long, but it had a groove cut through it. But when floated on corks or hung by a string, it would point just off north, eight degrees just off north. And this is interesting because many of their sites are oriented eight degrees off north, and we'll see a fine example of that at Levanta. It's also known there were other cultures here, about 1500 to 1800 BC, who predated the Olmec, and their Olmec influence uh, kind of came even from these cultures. So we're gonna see if we can actually see any of the actual site here. There's some unusual objects on display. Um, we're gonna see if there's any magnetism in any of the rocks. But this is really the Olmec heartland. This is where it all began and where all the Olmec influence spread out from. And we've even just seen what looks like a calendar stone. So this could show another piece, be another piece of the puzzle here where they could have developed the calendar here and at Tres Zapotes. So Jeff just showing me this, we've got this great big rock here with a sort of sprawling man over the top of this rock at San Lorenzo. So what have we got here? What have you spotted? Well, if you stabilise it above the navel, it touches the navel, about the right position. As you move it upwards, it suddenly goes almost halfway up. Uh, 
So you're getting a completely different magnetic reading. So can you move it around over the different part of the, the statue? The changes now. He said, I love this rock. So you're getting a magnetic effect, like a few, about a foot or so above. Yeah, it's yeah, about, about here there. it changes. So that's interesting. So, that's, so yeah, you're getting quite a strong magnetic effect. This is very odd. This is what we found. I mean, you mentioned we mentioned the navel. We were talking earlier, and it's often. Oh my God! You're getting it all over it. So we're getting very unusual magnetic anomalies on this one piece of rock. We've just found some magnetic anomalies occurring right at the navel near the belt, and you can see the facial features do show a kind of classic Olmec look. Almost looks like Hellboy or Jim Vieira. You can see the way the hands are holding onto the rock. It's very unusual, very interesting piece, not dissimilar to Gebekli Tepe. We have this piece here, which is just a massive anamorph figure. Can't really work out what's going on on here, but and you can see kind of channels cut through the top. You can see where it's like broken off here. This looks like a really oxide rich piece of basalt. So this is one of the famous altars which has been very badly weathered. But you can see the shaman or the priest kind of emerging from the cave or the earth. Can't really see much else in it, but no doubt it's probably holding a serpent or some kind of rope around the bottom. You can see a little piece of it here. The hand's going down there. It's almost in the quizzo position, but not quite. So this is the back of the altar. And look at these. You can see like four notches, almost like cut marks, which we have seen at other sites all around the world, including Gebekli Tepe. And also you've got like a shelf underneath it. And why this was here, I just don't know. Whether this was partly for engineering purposes to hold it in place, whether it had some other purposes, I know. Although now they think these are thrones, and actually people would sit on the kings and the leaders would sit on top of them. They weren't necessarily altars. So here we have the latest discovered Olmec head. That's why it's still here. This was only discovered in the last couple of decades, and it's actually found. Um, I think by an archaeologist who was out in the swamps on a boat and she saw this looking up at her and this is how it got rediscovered. And it's interesting because uh, some people suggest this could be a female face. We're not sure about that. But all these markings here, these sort of square circular uh, dimples here, could be representations of what we saw in the other room where they're like, they're, they're like magnetic, they're like magnetic pieces that can't come from the... Uh, Tuxla Mountains, they could be used as trade, could be used for ceremony, could be used for various other things. But again, we have all the classic features of the great Olmecs. Again, and also we see the back of it does appear to be flattened, a potential crani cranial deformation. JJ's just pointing out the beads that are in the museum here are very similar to what we see on the actual sort of hat, or the headgear of the great Olmec figure here. So these are the very small pieces here that are magnetic. And so these would have been used for trading. They could have been used for magical amulets. And these are all put together with these other pieces here. Then we find the exact same look actually on the most recently discovered Olmec head on the, uh, on the kind of helmet or leather hat is wearing. So we're just looking at the top of the Olmec head here at the San Lorenzo, the latest one to be discovered. It looks like it's caved in. It's very strange. How can that be if it's made of solid stone? Let's just sort of come down over the face here. It's pretty amazing. Then we have this very large square block just here in front of it. 
just shows you the they were kind of megalithic working in that kind of realm it's perfectly cut and it's got strange little carvings on it and you can see those here and whether they're keystone cuts to hold the block together or whether there's something else we're not too sure but it looks like a kind of almost like a weird jaguar kind of face unlike this dude who's clearly human with other pieces over here behind got a lot more anamorph kind of features you can see the kind of strange toes on this one and the all curled up with claws almost like a feline human combination with very high level of detail around the tail area we have like a almost like a seated figure here just some random blocks and then we have this sort of mutilated block which is something we keep finding, especially at San Lorenzo. We have this, what looks like a platform. It could easily have been where the head stood on it. Although it looks like it's some other kind of platform. It could even be a lintel going over the top and these could have been the mortise and tenon joints. This is one of the most impressive pieces I've actually seen in the Olmec land. It's some kind of uh, bird creature, the like guacamaya, they call it. And it's got beautiful feathers carved all in 3D, going all the way down the back here. It could well have had a human head on it, in fact. It may well have been some kind of humanoid animal figure, half human, half bird. No one knows exactly what the head was. But behind it over here, this is a particularly interesting statue because you see the arms and the feet going around the side. And this looks so much like some of the tiki statues that we find at Tiwanaku. So we have to question again, is there an influence stretching between these two cultures? And the reason I say that is because it's also got what looks like a turban, which is a design feature we find at Tiwanaku and a pumapunku and other features such as the hands of course has a very phallic looking head so whether that's a turban or whether it's a representation of some kind of fertility phallic symbol is unclear possibly both and again we come around the other side and you can see more detail as we sort of scan down it and you see like the kind of belt which is something these kind of symbols is what we do find a lot at Tiwanaku. So this one is called the giant and you can see the giant hand, huge hand at the bottom that JJ's just pointed out to me. I've not noticed that before. And then we have the huge sort of Olmecoid head on top. Again, it looks like he's wearing the classic Olmec cap or maybe a turban. But the hand down there is really it's like a symbolic huge hand. So I'm not sure exactly what that means. It looks like it was part of a larger statue. It's kind of got a fairly flat top. Not too much down the side that, that you can see anyway now. But really, really, it's almost like a column. And it's actually got a hole in the back as well. Whether that has any meaning, it's unclear. This is the Olmec monster, they call it. And what's interesting about this is not only the sort of amazingly Olmec face, but you've got growling mouth and a beard so we have a bearded figure in Olmec land which is quite a rarity we only really see that like the Uncle Sam statues and representations of what looks like Europeans but this is what JJ believes is kind of connected very similar to the Olmec head we see at Cholula the great the largest pyramid in the world and so they, they could prove the connection between these sites, between the classic Olmec going back 1500 BC and Cholula, which may have been built even partly that old, or certainly going up to about 200 AD officially. So just down here, we have some parts of the aqueduct system that was all over San Lorenzo. And you can see some of the beautifully cut bowls and, and look at the way that they sealed them. They sealed them on the top and all along the sides because they wanted clean water 
primarily, but they also was for electric charge. We have more, another throne here in fact, is what's left of it. More parts of the aqueduct and the structures. We have a seated figure here. who's holding something in his hands, whether that's just his foot, whether it's something else, I really don't know, but he looks like he's got a cloak on. So it looks like some very important personages were evident here at San Lorenzo. It's been slightly mutilated, obviously. And here we have some other random pieces. We have this very interesting piece, which is why this reminds me very much of some of the artifacts in the San Jose Museum in Costa Rica. So not only do we have these kind of trays with curved tops, we also have stone spheres like the one over here. So is there a connection with Costa Rica? I'm pretty sure there is. It looks like there's some kind of carving just on the outside of that as well. We have more pieces here, quite badly damaged. This is like a feline figure in a state of transformation. Just square chunks of what looks like sandstone, kind of dragon features on this one. Look at the features on that face. That is remarkable. And this one, it's got just a fragment and you can see the hand. See the fingers, I believe, and the arm. God, this is amazing. This looks like some kind of frog creature. And if we actually just turn the camera around a bit, look at it from this angle, which is not gonna work. You can see all the hands down there, kind of touching the ground. It's probably sticking out of the ground. So you have like a sort of a cat or a feline with a, with a human. He's sort of attacking the human next to him or climbing on it. It's very strange. In this one we have what looks like little serpents coming out of the rock. Look at this one here. It's a beautiful little serpent. It's like emerging from the rock. Some kind of lid maybe of one of the coffins. You can see some unusual symbols on the lower one here. Which look like a W. So we have another one of these mysterious massive discs. This is incredible. I mean, I wonder what this was used for. We see, we do see some kind of carvings on it. We see cut marks. This looks very red. So this is rich in iron oxide. So therefore electrically conductive and magnetic. And we see these sharp pieces down at the bottom here, kind of going straight up. It's almost like the back of an old mech head, but clearly this is a large disc which has been badly damaged and now broken. This is just one of the many mysteries of the great Olmec civilization here at San Lorenzo, yet to be deciphered fully. Here we have some scoop marks, which is a sort of design, a classic thing we saw on the big square block out front. But also, we find this at Machu Picchu, we find that Aswan Quarry and other places. This almost looks like it's cast rather than cut. This is very, very interesting piece. So the great Olmec culture really began here at San Lorenzo in around 1500 BC. And the San Lorenzo site itself was several acres, a 50 foot high platform with over 200 mounds being recorded at the site. With obviously all this stonework as part of the great ceremonial complex. It sat between the two rivers, two parts of the Coastal Cocos River heading south and now that just one side of the river goes around it but they had a very very sophisticated stoneworking technology as we've seen in the museum and they were moving very large stones very long distances so this really was a megalithic culture here on the Gulf Coast of Mexico 
We're going to go and try and find the site now. We've looked at the statues, we've looked at the recently discovered Olmec colossal head. Let's hope we can find this incredible mound site, the centre of the Olmec world. So we're up on the main site now of um, San Lorenzo, the Olmec capital. You can just see around behind me, there's various mounds and earthworks. This one here looks like the most prominent mound. There's one behind it over there. And there's a few you can just see around here. These aren't perfectly clear like they were at Tres Sapotes. The one over there in the distance is quite prominent. So we are now at the main site of San Lorenzo. This is just one of the places I've been wanting to visit for years. I've been studying the Olmec for something like 10 years now. So to come to the heartland, to the center of their world, really inspires me. This whole area we're walking in now was once the ceremonial complex. And I would imagine the mound behind me, this elongated mound, and also the one behind me over here, that these were where the great Olmec kings once lived. And they had structures on top here. They had water channels with all the sluice gates we saw in the museum coming down into the main area here. This whole area is a massive, massive area with over 200 mounds on it. And so it really does give a sense of what they were up to, but there's really nothing left here to see. It's quite depressing. Just behind me, you can see this little swamp here at San Lorenzo. This is the swamp, the latest discovered Olmec head that's now on display in the San Lorenzo Museum it was discovered. It was actually buried face upwards inside this swamp. So it's probably used to be just on this ridge here. That's where it probably originally stood. And that's where it sort of faced into the main complex. So it's really interesting that in 1994, just by having a look in this swamp, someone who was wading or had a little raft actually found it. So this is fascinating to find the actual spot where one of these heads was actually discovered. The center of the Olmec world, this is exactly where we are right now. On this huge plateau that was once engulfed by two sides of the coastal, Quetzal Coastal River, which comes in from the Gulf Coast all the way down, meanders like a serpent, and like there's like a serpent head on the coast. And this is like in the belly of the great river serpent. And although there's not much left here, what we can say about this place is that the serpentine shape seems to occur with some of these mounds. Um, you can see that just with the one I'm standing on and it curves round slightly behind me. It's quite tough to see because it's all everything's green. Everything kind of blends into one. But we know this was one of the main mounds I'm standing on now, this elongated mound. Whereas this one over here is clearly like the mound, a smaller version of the mound we saw at Tres Sapotes. But still, all of these are very important and probably all had some meaning. And, and geomantic placement because we know that the, the builders of this site, they were geomancers. They were working with compasses. They were working with alignments. Now we know that their compass that they discovered, which was only a few inches long and made of lodestone or iron ore, was actually able to detect an alignment eight, eight degrees off north, which is exactly the way many of the sites are oriented, including Leventa. And so they, they chose magnetic areas. This area here has got much iron ore in the area. It's engulfed by rivers, there's underground water here. And although we can't see it really now, this was a thriving, powerful, ancient metropolis. And uh, absolute delight to be here, I must admit. So we're taking the group here. So this is what we do on our Megalithomania tours. We get to see sites that no one else does. So we're really, really pleased we made it here.